This is our usual questions and answers spot. We did one last week because we had uh, quite a few questions and some of them uh, deserve a, a lengthy answer. Some, uh, sometimes we can get three or four in, but uh, tonight is another one of those occasions where we're going to take the whole time in answering the question. And uh, I think you'll see why when you see the question. Question is, I can't imagine our consumerism culture, non-Christian spending habits, being very pleasing to God. God uh, Jesus spoke often about generosity and not living for this world. So, how should Christians use money? Should we be learning to live on less, denying self, and be more generous to fulfill Christ's commands? Well, uh, the first thing we want to take a look at is the fact that uh, it has often been observed that Americans almost have an obsession with materialism. Even uh, many of our popular songs in uh, times past have noted that particular problem. I uh, have used the uh, song by Ray Stevens, Mr. Businessman, in time past. Let me just remind you of a couple of the verses that really spotlight the um, uh, problem that we have. It begins with, itemize the things you covet as you squander through your life, bigger cars, bigger houses, term insurance for your wife. These are things that many people are enamored with. And the idea is to have more and more and better and better. And uh, we seem to think uh, almost that we're entitled to these things and that these are the goals that, that every person ought to have. A few more uh, lines, uh, spending counterfeit uh, incentive, wasting precious time and health, placing value on the worthless, disregarding priceless wealth. And of course, the priceless wealth that he's referring to there is, uh, are things that are intangible, uh, that cannot be purchased with money, things of, uh, of an ascetic nature, things perhaps involving love, uh, family, things uh, for which we ought to truly be appreciative and which are true riches. And of course, we could add to that, even though that's not really part of the song, the spiritual truths and the spiritual riches that we have in Christ. And then he concludes by saying, when they take that final inventory, yours will be the same sad story everywhere. No one will really care. No uh, one more lonely than this rich, important man. Let's have your autograph. Endorse your epitaph. And then uh, adds, you'd better take care of business, Mr. Businessman. What's your plan? So that is uh, one idea that we have seen in uh, years past. However, we want to call attention to a, another criticism of uh, materialistic culture, which has been observed by uh, Americans. And uh, this one was a song written by the songwriting team of Jerry Goffin and Carol King, who were married. Uh, they had some early success with Will You Love Me Tomorrow by the Shirelles, which went to number one in 1961. And then also Take Good Care of My Baby by Bobby V, also a number one song that year. Uh, the Locomotion, which was remade two or three times, I think, after the original by little Eva, who was the babysitter. That's true, she was. <laughs> and that went to number one uh, in 1962. Go Away Little Girl by Steve Lawrence, number one in the uh, same year. Up on the Roof by the Drifters went to number five. One Fine Day by the Chiffons went to number five. Natural Woman by Aretha Franklin, number eight in 1967. And then the song that we're getting to here which was done by the monkeys called Pleasant Valley Sunday, which went to number three. This is the one that was uh, social commentary, although uh, Will You 
Love Me Tomorrow had a, a great moral message in it also. But uh, in this particular song, it must have struck a nerve because it was a hit all over the world. It went to number 11 in the United Kingdom, number 10 in Australia, number 4 in Norway. I didn't even know they had record charts there. Um, number 2 in New Zealand and in Canada, and of course, as I already said, number 3 here. They got the title, the inspiration was, uh, for the song title, because the road they lived on or drove on every day was called Pleasant Valley Way. It was in West Orange, New Jersey, where they were living at the time. The road followed a valley through several communities among the uh, Wachung Mountains, and the lyrics were a social commentary about life in suburbia. And here are some of the lyrics. The local rock group down the street is trying hard to learn their song. They serenade the weekend squire who just came out to mow his lawn. Another Pleasant Valley Sunday, charcoal burning everywhere. Rows of houses that are all the same, but no one seems to care. See Mrs. Gray, she's proud today because her roses are in bloom. And Mr. Green, he's so serene, he's got a TV in every room. Another Pleasant Valley Sunday here in status symbol land. Mothers complain about how hard life is and the kids just don't understand. Well, this is an accurate commentary of life in the 60s. Uh, and it was uh, uh, right on the money so far as the assessment goes. But here is the interesting thing. Creature comfort goals can only numb my soul and make it hard for me to see. My thoughts all seem to stray to places far away. I need a change of scenery. Isn't that what creature comforts do? Don't they numb our souls? And don't they cause us to place value on the worthless and disregard priceless wealth? Yes, and that is precisely what Jesus was teaching in Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 20. And we also want to consider 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10 and Amos' uh, denunciation of materialism in Amos 6, 1 through 8. But let's go to the passage that was just read for us a moment ago first, Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. He was asked a question, and we didn't read that part of it, but let's back up to verse 13. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to and divide the inheritance with me. Now, Jesus did not delve into what their family situation was. He did not ask how much money is there and how ought that to be divided. He didn't get into any of those details because he knew there was a problem either on the part of the man asking the question or on the part of his brother. And so he knew that problem was covetousness and so rather than get bogged down in a bunch of details, on the matter, and then they probably would have disputed those details as to how much money there was in the estate. He said, take heed and beware of covetousness. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Now, how many people do you think in the United States believe that? How many people do you believe that? that you know, we labor and we work to get more and more and more. And uh, there is never enough, and some people are willing to cut corners and step on other people in order to rise above and get more. We have such things as uh, blackmail going on for some people to uh, receive more money. That's nothing new. That, that was happening in the Old Testament. Um, there are many ways that people try to cheat and steal. 
And that's nothing new. That's why the Old Testament talks about carrying around just weights because some had two sets of weights. And uh, they were cheating their customers with one set of weights. However, if they knew somebody was pretty sharp, they'd, they'd use the right weights because they knew they'd probably get caught. Uh, many people are covetous. What was uh, one of the temptations of Jesus? He was shown all the kingdoms of the world in hopes that he would covet them and desire to have them. Uh, people want wealth. People want power. Uh, they still covet all of these kinds of things. So that's why Jesus says it, take heed and beware of covetousness. When you stand before God on the day of judgment, is he going to ask uh, how many cars did you have? You know, there's some celebrities, I think Jay Leno has maybe 30 or 40 cars, something like that. Uh, there are people who have houses that they've never even been to that they own. They collect them. Is God going to be impressed? Oh, say, you collected 11 houses. Boy, you should be entered right into heaven, ushered right in right now. No, that's not going to happen. That doesn't say anything about character. That doesn't say anything about love for others. In fact, it kind of indicates a love for self, doesn't it? So beware of covetousness. These things are not the things that matter. These things are not going to give eternal life. These things do not make somebody uh, well-loved by others. Uh, these things do not make a person generous to speak of. So uh, then Jesus goes on to say this story about the, the man who all he could think about was, boy, I don't have enough space. I am so prosperous, but I need more space to store everything. And so he built the bigger barns, and God says to him, what, you fool? Tonight your soul shall be required of you. Then whose will these things be? You're going to pass them on to other people. Didn't Solomon make that point in the book of Ecclesiastes? Whatever you have when you die is going to somebody else. And who knows whether he's going to be wise or foolish. That turned out to be somewhat prophetic. His son, whom he had taught all about wisdom, turned out to be foolish. And he lost the kingdom because of it. But you can labor and toil and amass and get all of this stuff. But when you die, somebody else is going to get it. So this is what Jesus said. You don't want to lay up treasures for yourself. But this is what it's like for the person who does so and is not rich toward God, is not rich toward God. That's a better focus of attention than one's self. Now let's go to 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. And uh, once again, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Now there's something to search for. How can I be godly? Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Have you ever heard of uh, somebody who uh, died, and after the funeral, somebody came running up and said, you know, we just drove by his house, and all of his furnishings are gone. Well, if that happens, probably somebody broke in during the funeral and stole them. But uh, nobody says, you know, his, his, he took it with him. It just does not happen. It's all left behind. Certainly, we can't carry anything out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare 
and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So there again is a warning about as plain as can be against being covetous and what's wrong with being covetous. Then uh, let's go back to Amos chapter 6 because culture in their day was not unlike our day. Amos chapter 6, except it wasn't songwriters commenting on their luxury. It was God commenting on it. Let's see what we have beginning with Romans or, uh, Amos 6 and verse 1. Woe to you who are at ease in Zion and trust in Mount Samaria, notable persons in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel comes. And here's the folly in trusting either in your own defenses or somebody else's defenses if they're protecting you as a nation. Go over to Kalna and see, and from there go to Hamath the Great, then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms, or is their territory greater than your territory? Woe to you who put off the day of doom, who caused the seed of violence to come near. So they can't be protected. They're not going to be protected from God's wrath. They can't go and depend on some other nation or city for protection against God's wrath. If God chooses to destroy a nation, he will destroy it. Then he continues, Woe unto you who lie on beds of ivory. Do you see the picture of wealth that is painted there in, in those few words? Stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from the flock, and calves from the midst of the stall, who chant to the sound of stringed instruments, and invent for yourselves in musical instruments like David, who drink wine from bowls and anoint yourselves with the best ointments. But are you grieved for the affliction of Joseph? Let's stop there just for a moment. Everything that is described here is one of wealth, of luxury, of contentedness, and self-absorption, being involved with uh, entertainment constantly. This is the kind of society we live in. And it was the kind of society they lived in. Verses 7 and 8, Therefore they shall now go captive as the first of the captives, and those who recline at banquets shall be removed. The Lord has sworn by himself the Lord God of hosts says, I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his palaces. Therefore, I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. God is not pleased. Now, is wealth per se bad? No, except when it becomes self-consuming and everybody is absorbed in it and selfish and unconcerned about anyone or anything else. Well, since we've brought up that subject, what are America's spending habits? According to the latest statistics I could find that are available, here's how Americans spend their money. Housing, 34.1%. That makes sense. Transportation, gas, that includes gasoline, oil, buying a car or renting or whatever, 17.6%. Food, well, we, we count that as important, don't we? However, uh, half of this is half food. It's either 55, 45, one way or the other, I can't remember which, but about half is on fast food. 12.4% altogether we uh, spend. Insurance, which includes pensions and Social Security and so on, 
Then there's health care, 5.7%. Notice this one, entertainment, 5.4%. Cash contributions, 3.7%. That's not bad, considering many never give anything. Uh, somebody's lifting that up, and I, I suspect it's, uh, in part, faithful members of the Lord's Church. Uh, but there are atheists, there are agnostics, there are people who claim to be Christians who never make any contributions. So, actually, I'm surprised this is as high as it is. 3.7%. Uh, household, household furnishings, 3.4%. Household operations, 2%. Education, 1.9%. Miscellaneous, 1.6%. Housekeeping supplies, 1.3%. Then we get into the smaller regions. Personal care, 1.2%. Alcohol, 09 Of all the things on here, this one really surprises me the most. Only 0.9%? Seriously? When you consider how many commercials there are and how you can't go any place uh, without being asked if you uh, want a free sample of wine or this or that or the other thing, it's amazing to me that only 0.9% is spent on alcohol. Tobacco, 0.7%. Life insurance, 0.6%. And the last one? at 0.2 percent reading now we spend 1.9 percent on education but apparently it's not working if only 0.2 percent read so that's the, uh, the list and uh, if you have a calculator you'll find that it's interesting this adds up to about 103 percent but <laughs> nevertheless it's close to 100 percent Math skills were not on here, I guess. Uh, the first uh, three of these that were listed are we consider necessities, uh, a place to live, food, and transportation. However, I would add another necessity, and that is giving. Let's turn to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Proverbs chapter 3. Verses 9 and 10. And interestingly, this uh, is in a uh, chapter where uh, some have admitted these are some of their favorite verses. Verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Well, just a few verses later, we read in verse 9, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. I think this is a necessity. Many people, especially non-Christians, look at this probably as quite optional. But... For those who believe in the word of God, this is not optional. God expects this. He is the one who blesses us with all that we have. And I, it's only right and proper to return to him a significant portion of what he has given us. Without him, we wouldn't have it. So uh, some of the others are higher than you would expect and lower. But did you notice what was particularly high, higher than cash contributions? Entertainment. Entertainment, five plus percent. That probably puts us in a category like those of whom Amos was denouncing. What the Bible requires of us in answer to the question that was asked is that we be good stewards with what we have. That does not mean it is wrong to buy a new car. That does not mean it is wrong to make home improvements. But it does mean that we should be generous toward God and not just 
thinking of ourselves as so many that we looked at in the scriptures did. And yes, we should be generous, uh, but some uh, may feel guilty. You know, I, I've got more than other people, and even though I give uh, a portion to God, and even though I'm generous, I still have a lot left over, and that's true. And so some may feel guilty, like, well, maybe I should just get it all, give it all away. Well, if you had $10 million and gave it all away, it wouldn't go very far. We have a few more than 7 billion people in the world. And if you had $7 billion, you could only afford to give everybody else a buck. That's all you could do with it. Somebody says, well, but a lot of people, uh, half the people don't need that dollar. Okay, well, then you can give everybody else two. That isn't going very far, is it? Uh, so there's no uh, qualification to give away all that you have unless, like that one person that was trusting in riches, if you're trusting in riches, then maybe you should. Maybe you should give away most everything. But if you're using it for good, and if you're using it for God and causes related to God uh, that he is involved in, then you do not have to get rid of everything that you have. We have rich people in the Old Testament, uh, fewer in the New, but they are still there. But here's what you can't, uh, can do. You cannot stamp out poverty. Governments have been trying that. They haven't done it yet. But here's what you can do. You can't get everybody out of poverty, but you can help people hear the gospel and get them to heaven, which is far better. First, we ought to be supporting the local congregation uh, that we're a member of because we are reaching people all over the world periodically. We have somebody like Scott Shanahan come in, as he did a couple of months ago, and show us what the money that we have been giving over in Pompeii is doing and how many have been uh, brought to Christ and got married too in the process, as you'll recall. So if uh, you want to look that over, that's the first priority. Now, if you want to spend even more money, well, fine. If you think I have an abundance and I can do more good, there's certainly nothing stopping you. It's a matter of individual conscience. And uh, that's why the, the Bible doesn't say if you make this much money, you need to give 50% of it away or something like that. It's a matter of each individual making the determination. Now, I might add that uh, our stewardship should be considered beyond our life and into our death. What are we doing with what we have? Where is it going after we depart? Uh, Brother Guy N. Woods divided up his estate um, among several faithful congregations and schools. Uh, I was at Pearl Street at the time and I learned that he had given the congregation there because of their faithfulness, because of their annual lectureships and so forth. Uh, their emphasis on the word, he had given them about 3,000, about 3% of what he left behind. That's a, uh, that's a great way to look at it. Uh, G.K. Wallace wrote an essay. It's in, uh, I think it's in his book called Gleanings at the end of the book. And he urged brethren to leave money to a worthy spiritual effort rather than to family members who would spend it on themselves and on the devil. We know of some who have left behind perhaps more than $250,000 to relatives that did not love them while they were alive and wasted it after they died. What's the point in doing that? We're responsible for our money, period. And we need to be careful and be good stewards, both while we're alive and with what is left after we depart. 
from this earth. And by the way, since so many schools are, are not really worthy these days, you might want to put that in the hands of an executor to uh, distribute to worthy efforts of conservative brethren uh, across the country and somebody who will follow your wishes. So in answer to the question, we need to follow biblical principles. We need to weigh these things. Are we consumed with ourselves? Are we selfish? Are we giving to us? Or are we using what the Lord has entrusted to us for the benefit of others, for the spreading of the gospel? That's the way to deal with this, and each one of us needs to answer that for ourselves. As uh, somebody once said, do not use people and love money. Love people and use money. It's given to us for a tool and for the right uh, purpose, and that's our decision to make. Let's uh, pray that we use it wisely. Now this evening we haven't talked about obeying the gospel, we've talked about spreading the gospel, but if you know what you need to do, if you know about uh, uh, faith in Christ, if you know about repenting of your sins, one of which obviously is covetousness, if you know about confessing the name of Jesus before men, if you know about being baptized and are ready to do so, we invite you to come. If you're already his child, but you think something in your life has been deficient, we invite you to come too while we stand and while we sing.